Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and we are in it. It is the 2020 Olympic Games, the first of our Olympic champions to sit down and give us the rundown of how Olympic Games works this week is Olympic champion in the 4x200 free relay, four-time Olympic medalist. We're talking to Caitlin Sandino. Yay, thank you so much for having me on. I'm honored. Look the part <laughs> decked out in red, white, and blue. Yes. You can tell you can tell you watched opening ceremonies this morning, which is the first thing I want to hit. Um, just just seeing it from your couch, you know, being so far removed from the actual event. What what comes up for you um, being being a two time Olympian? I have to admit, Coleman, I got emotional this morning. I don't really find myself an emotional person, uh, but there were plenty of times that I was like, oh, wow, my allergies, woo! Um, I definitely got teary-eyed just thinking of everything that these athletes have been through the last 18 months and the roller coaster. And honestly, as a fan, like the world, like I need this too, you know? And so um, it touched me pretty strongly today. I mean, I've been retired since the, you know, my last Olympic games was 04. So I've sat through plenty of these since, but I can honestly say this is the first um, Olympic opening ceremonies that I've gotten emotional in uh, since competing. I was, I was taking a walk this morning and I had the exact same thought, you know, obviously I'm, I'm media, this affects my job, but I, I don't compete. I was walking this morning. It's just like, oh my God, it feels like such a relief that it is finally happening. I mean, even this week, you know, there were positive tests. Uh, There was, and I think that just kind of got people nervous again. Like, is it, are are we actually going to happen? But we're people marched, the ceremonies happened. So it's like, oh my gosh, finally (laughs) it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. It felt that way too. I felt like I was holding my breath this week. And reading, you know, some of these headlines that were quite frankly, pretty, um, they're, they were discouraging. And I was like, I, part of me is like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing this rumor that it's going to get canceled or they're having meetings about canceling it. And my first reaction was like, everybody's already there. Like, what? Would, I can't, I can't even wrap my head around that. And I was like, please stop playing with these athletes emotions. It's been so tough. So seeing the ceremony start today was a huge, I feel like you could just like weight off the shoulders, like let's come together as a world and celebrate something to bring us together in, in this very trying time. No kidding. It's yeah. It just feels like such a relief. I'm, I'm so stoked. We get to cover it. We get to watch it as fans. Uh, I know you never walked in the opening ceremonies because swimming is the day after. I know a lot of swimmers don't. W- was that something that was discussed by the team, by the coaches, or did they leave it up to a case by case, an, an individual choice? Or was that kind of like a team thing of coaches are like, okay, you're not going to do this. Yeah. You know, while I was competing, it was more of um, up to the individual. I swam the 400 IM in both my Olympics. So that's the first day. Um, so that's a long day. And especially um, from what I have been hearing is that this was a little bit more of a condensed session too, for the athletes. Like it wasn't as long as a production as it has been in the past. So having said that, um, you know, it's, it's a long event and it's tiring and you're on your feet for a long time and you're waiting. It's, you know, quote unquote, it's draining. So knowing that I had the 400 IM the next day, I did not participate in the opening. I've actually never was there for a closing either. So I never got to watch the in, in the flesh, you know, but um, you know, you just need to be smart. You need to make the right decisions and know when you are racing and how much time you need downtime. Um, Some athletes like that distraction and want to be a part of the energy and part of, you know, the show, like as they should be, but some athletes know that it's too much to take on um, because you have to have your top priority being your races. Did, did, did you have teammates that win or did you ever remember yeah. hearing stories about, you know, they come back and they're like, oh my God, this is what happened in opening ceremonies. Yeah, definitely. Plenty of representation on this one team that still went and, you know, living vicariously through their stories. And we would watch the, the, the competitors that wouldn't go, we would watch it together in the village. So that was kind of special too, to be rooting on your teammates and seeing your teammates out there, like all spiffed up in their red, white, and blue and having the pride of that 
you know, this is really going to date myself, but when I was racing, there was no social media. So I feel like now in this time of social media, even for myself, like I feel like I've been a part of team USA since trials. I mean, obviously I was at trials, but then them in Hawaii, cause you know, I follow most of these athletes. So being a part of their day to day and seeing what the lifestyle was in Hawaii for them and then their training camp. And then a lot of them posting, or when I woke up this morning, posting, they all got their outfits on, you know, we don't know. I couldn't tell who actually walked or did it, but it looked like they all got dressed up. They were all taking pictures. They were all celebrating in the village together. So now with social media, like I feel like it brings a whole nother level to the fans and for the outsiders that aren't there. And even more so for these families that don't get to be there this year. So I feel like they get this in close or in depth, like behind the scenes that a lot of athletes are sharing, which I think that's really special. Agreed. Uh, I mean, I think the Olympic journey, once you make it from trials first swimmer, it's yeah, it's always been kind of a mystery. Everyone's kind of yeah. like, well, what, what really happens? What goes <laughs> on? And now, yeah, I look at my phone for 10 minutes every day and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I know they have for breakfast, training. lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I know what suits and caps they're wearing. <laughs> it's really neat though. Like, like I said, I, I didn't have that when I was competing. And I think it's such an interesting aspect. Um, but it's up to the individual how much they want to share or engage. Like I saw, for example, Tom Shields was basically like, okay, guys, signing out for the next week. Um, you know, so I'll be curious to see how many athletes stay engaged with social media or, you know, decide it's time to get rid of that distraction and, and sign off. Which is, which I think is something we've seen from top athletes in the past at various competitions. And yeah, it's pretty interesting to, to just see how different athletes handle that in different yeah. ways, especially I, I, you know, this is like the media event of the, of the last four years, right? Absolutely. I think obviously it has even more eyes on it than it has in the past because these last 18 months. And I feel like the the world, we need this more than ever too. So I think the eyes on it is going to be more than we've ever seen before. Yeah, that's that. I think that's a great point. Um, and so even though we have the advantage of social media, I still want to get your perspective on just the Olympic lifestyle, which starts with the Olympic village, right? <laughs> moving, moving into the village, just, I, I think, I think of it and it's, it's like this whole nother world, but then you kind of bring it back down to like, okay, no, this is just like the normal world. You're, you're basically living in a hotel, right? For, for a few weeks. <laughs> depends where you are. Each scenario has been different. Um, you know, the beds have looked interesting at this Olympic games, if you've noticed that. Um, but yeah, when I look back to, when I think of, uh, my Olympic games, my bed wasn't very big either. And I think it was back then it was so funny. Cause we're like, here we are with some of the biggest athletes in the world, literally <laughs> in these tiny little beds and their feet are hanging off. We have this little sheet. Um, but you know, it's, it's an equal playing ground, right? I mean, cause we're all given the same accommodations and we're all eating at the same um, cafeteria. And there's always the exceptions. Like there are some teams that choose to stay in hotels, but I feel like being in the Olympic village is part of the camaraderie and part of that bond that these athletes will always share in something that only they got to experience and they can reminisce on. And, you know, from teams to teams, we all remember that one place in the village, or it looks like at this um, Olympic village, they have these really cool like gaming centers and, you know, they can throw, it looks like the stars into the have you seen that they're like playing oh, darts no. like it's the, all these like the ninja cool, like, stars things. yes thank you ninja stars yeah and I was like whoa are they really doing this so you know it's just a really um it's a really special atmosphere it's almost like thinking about being on your club uh sorry on your college campus but with only the best athletes in the whole entire world it's like this elite sorority and fraternity and it's this this bond that will always be solidified through um this unique living lifestyle. Uh, and, but I'll never forget the, the almost like, hmm, like when he was, for example, when we walked into the cafeteria and Team USA is all out in our red, white, and blue matching attire, the amount of eyes that just like stare at you as you walk in. And I don't know if each country feels that way and each team feels that way, or if that's because when I was in 04, you know, we were the Olympic swim team, which already had so much attention on it because of how popular the sport of swimming is in Australia. But I just felt like there's always eyeballs on us because there was so much attention to how strong we were as a unit. And uh, again, just how sharp we were and how much we came in. And it, it was almost tension filled too, you know, like you could feel it and you can sense it. And it's almost like, 
all right, game on. And we're just like trying to get our pasta. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I, so that's one thing I don't think about is all these different, distra- not distractions, but all these different things to do in the village, right? All right. these activities outside of where you sleep, where you eat. Right. Um, and all the, all the travel that can kind of add up or build up over time. Cause I've heard it's a lot of walking. I know, yes. I think I talked to Emily Seabom and she had this crazy story about trying to buy bikes in the oh. Olympic village. Oh my um, God. Yeah. Waiting but, for the buses, the bus schedule. Like you're, you're okay. not, you're not catered to, right. It's not just team USA. All right, guys, just be here and we'll leave. It's know your bus schedule, when to leave. If you don't get on, you have to wait for the next one. If you're just missed that bus, you have to wait for the next. I mean, you have to like really sync up your schedule, your warm up schedule, even just mm. your cafeteria. It's like, don't miss the bus or, or like Emily, you're walking or trying to buy bikes. <laughs> yeah. Which, which I totally didn't realize. That's crazy. It was in, in Athens or in Sydney was there, was there a place outside of the cafeteria or the hotel that you would go that it was like, oh, this is the, this is the place to go. This is super cool. Oh, you know, both locations had um, a USA house, which was really special because that's where you could meet your family. That was getting food other than the cafeteria. That was big screen TVs and watching other sports compete. Um, it was like home base to be with your your home people, you know. So that place was like the special place to be, and then also be able to go with your teammates to meet with their family and and to see like the the celebrities or the superstars of other sports. You know, I remember being in there and LeBron James was playing ping pong with one of his teammates, and it was like, oh my gosh, like that's so crazy. You know what I mean? So um, being starstruck amongst your peers. <laughs> no kidding. I've I've already seen Katie Ledecky post pictures with Kevin Durant. It's yes. just like. Yes. This is awesome. <laughs> this is so cool. This is what it's all about. <laughs> this, is, this is what it's all about. So I didn't realize, sorry, I'm, I know I'm backtracking. I didn't realize that, uh, that USA didn't have their own bus or that they didn't have their own thing. Like you, so you have to really be on top of it, which yeah. you got, how, how much earlier did you get there before the game started just in order to acclimate and get, right. get your routine, get your schedule down? A really good question because this was a long time ago, Coleman. But you know what they've done in the past, I believe they're still doing, is that you know they do the camp on U.S. soil, and then you head over closer to location. But you also do another camp before you even check into the village. Mm-hmm. So I feel like when we would actually get to the village, it wasn't that long before the competition started. I want to say four days, maybe five max. Um, just to keep us kind of out of that energy and that excitement and kind of have to go up the flow more like you're not as catered to. Um, so being in just another training environment, what's all about you, all about Team USA, you're not waiting for buses, you know, it's this, like I said, very catered, almost spoiled. And then when it's time to get to the village, get all checked in credentials, learn the security lines, a lot of it's learning it, right? Learning where you're staying, learning where the cafeteria is, learning how far, how soon or how long that you have, it takes you to get to X, Y, and Z. Um, Um, And then there's drug testing there too. So when I swam 4am on the first night, I was, um, I was urine drug tested at the pool, but then I had to go to the village and do blood drug testing. And then they make you sit there for that too. And and they watch your blood spin and spin spin, and you're just like, okay, I really need to eat and go to bed. And so there's a lot that happens there as well. That's, you know, you need to know the way of the land. Yeah, that's (laughs) Sounds like so much getting used to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and that brings us to your event lineup, um, especially in in 2004. You send the 400 IM day one and then turn around and spend the 400 free day two. I don't think... I don't, I don't think Americans do that anymore. <laughs> oh gosh, Colin, that was the hardest, like back to back. I have a great story about that though, because... 400 IM was my baby and that was like my race, right? And that's what all my attention was on. And that at the 04 Olympic trials, I wasn't even going to swim the four free, but um, my, my coach at the time was car- coach Mark Schubert. And he was like, well, let's just swim prelims to swim that 400 IM out of you and just get you ready for the rest of the meet. Cause I was going to have like the two fly, two free, two IM. And I was even going to do like the eight free. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just do prelims. Well, I ended up swimming prelims at trials and like went this best time that I hadn't done in forever. And I was qualified first for finals. And Schubert's like, well, I think we should probably swim this. I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, I mean, look, I was like, okay. So then I ended up swimming at trials, go crazy best time, ended up winning. And I was like, 
okay, was not a part of the plan. So then, you know, fast forward to the Olympic games, I swim the 400 IM and have like this race of a lifetime, a, a personal best, like no other, a very emotional, very draining, um, very bittersweet moment in my swimming career. Um, I was second by 12 and hundreds of a second, but the backstory of it was just going this best time and being in contention and being in this race. And I'll never forget, I got out of the pool and I was on like cloud nine, right? And and I had gone through so many, I was gonna say ups and downs, but a lot of downs in this 400 I am. And Schubert had been a part of that, like day in and day out. Like I tried to give up this race numerous times and he wouldn't let me. So I run over to him, I give him a huge hug. Like I'm in giggles and tears. I was like, I can't believe this just happened. And he's like, that was a good race. Tomorrow morning's going to hurt really bad. Go warm down. And it was like, wait, we don't get to celebrate. Like this is the craziest race of my life. And he was just like, tomorrow is going to be deadly, you know, and no lie that 400 free prelim swim hurt so bad, like so bad. And I hardly got any sleep the night before. Cause like I shared, you, I had both drug testing media, just go through security. Uh, I ate ca- the cafeteria. It was like 2 AM. By the time I got to the cafeteria, like only McDonald's was like serving. And then I'm on such a high anyways. Like, how do I fall asleep after that? Prelims of the 400 free was just horrendous. I think I qualified like sixth for finals. I want to say like, it was like, Oh gosh, I just got in. And then luckily I think off of adrenaline and I'm just such a racer. I was able to pull off a bronze medal uh, in the four free. So it was a silver in the four. I am a bronze in the four free. And that was like a Saturday, Sunday. I'm like, well, that was a fun weekend. <laughs> no. so, and it wasn't done yet. <laughs> the two fly in the 400 freestyle or sorry, the 800 freestyle relay uh, is still to go. So it was quite the, it was quite the meat schedule back then. <laughs> that, that is a, I mean, that's, I, I know you were before him, but that's like, that's Phelpsian, right? That's, that's an intense <laughs> schedule. I know people were like, oh my God, that's like, so like Phelps. I was like, excuse me, I'm older than Phelps. So it's kind of like he just pulled Sandino, right? Uh, right. It's, he, Phelps was Sandonian. <laughs> <laughs> you i like that <laughs> oh it's good that, yeah we we are we are not seeing olympic schedules like that uh this time around which but i'm so glad you gave us the backstory because i i was i was doing my research before this and it's like holy crap like that's a day one, that that's like you said that is a, such an action-packed weekend um yeah, it really was so after coming off of you get Tell me about Monday. That's what I want to know about. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a day like after, off. Yeah, like after you get through four four hundreds in yeah. two days, um, what? How do you? How do you come down from that? You know, uh, honestly, I don't think I ever did. I just stayed on this high and just adrenaline. And I, I did the Today Show and I did um, the um, like the Billy Bush show at the time. It was at Entertainment Tonight or something like that. So I did like the little media circuit, and it was you know short and sweet. It was pretty well protected as far as like, I still had more racing to go, but you know, I just lived it up. I mean, I have a lot of energy. I was like built for stuff like this. And it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Like when you're in the moment, like you're just living it. And when you get off to such a great start like that, I mean, you've worked so hard for that. And then just the team vibes and the team culture and just the Olympic culture in itself just keeps you just, you know, floating on air. And, and I think, think that's why that post Olympic blues is such a real thing because it, it is like something I can't explain. And it's like, then you have to come down from that and like, just do life <laughs> like, go to the grocery store. Like what? So, you know, <laughs> I I just, for myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's just, I think I just stayed on that adrenaline rush and, and I continue to do that for my next two races after i mean obviously you get silver you get bronze and you're excited about that i don't obviously you didn't even expect to swim the foreign free <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what your expectations were in the im but it, as you said you were stoked for silver heading into that relay were you were you really on a mission for gold you know honestly coleman it was crazy because i had the the 200 fly and the 800 freestyle really were the same day. And I swam the 200 fly um, prelims, swam fast, qualified for semifinals. 
And out of semifinals, I was actually seated first going into finals of the 200 butterfly. And that got in my head. I don't like to be seated first. I like to be third, fourth, fifth, sixth, uh, seventh, eighth. <laughs> I don't like to be first. I don't like to have the target on my back. And it was funny. Um, Eddie Reese pointed it out to me after the fact. So I swam the 200 fly and I ended up getting fourth after finals. And Eddie said, you know, you were different before you got out there before your 200 fly. I was like, really? He's like, I think you let that place get in your head. And I'm like, you're probably right. You know, I, I put more pressure on myself because I wasn't expecting that in the two fly for me too. I mean, it was relatively a new event for me. I was teetering between doing that and the 200 I am at trials. It wasn't like 200 fly was my race. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I was going into final seat at first, it was like, Oh damn. And that, that got to me. It, it honestly did. And so I got out of the pool. I got fourth. I mean, I, I missed the bronze by like a fingernail and I was pissed and I walked over to Schubert again and I, and Schubert was my college coach and he knew he almost, I think he liked when I had a bad race because he knew my next race was going to be so good. I feel like I did a really great job as an athlete channel, channeling a bad swim into a good swim. Um, I really did let it get to me. Like at NC toys, I, I, my junior year, I won both of my races and got a second by like a fingernail. And I didn't talk to anybody for like 36 hours. Like I was pissed. And so like, you know, it's like, look out, get out of her way. So I just got and Schubert's like, get down, go get in the warm down pool, swim it out, get it out of your system. So I got it out of my system, got together with the ladies, uh, Natalie Coughlin, Dana Vollmer and Carly Piper and Natalie's leadership and just so cool, calm, collective, so confident yet um, in the moment and just the words that she said. And I was like, let's freaking do this, you know? And um, I don't remember how much time I had. I know it wasn't a lot of time. I remember when we walked out as a relay, you know, we went hands up got down and instead of standing up at the blocks of the team, I went and I sat down like behind the timer, just kind of still shaking my legs out. Um, luckily I was the anchor. So I had a little bit more time. Um, obviously a gold medal is always in the back of your mind uh, for this race specifically. I had heard rumors that we were close to a world record too. So that was kind of in the back of my mind, but I'm not much of a times or record person. So I don't usually think about that. It was more like, don't let your team down and enjoy the moment. This was my first relay I'd ever been on. And it was my last race at these Olympics. And you never know if that's ever going to be your last Olympic race. And it ended up being my last Olympic race. So, oh, just, that was pretty surreal, Coleman. It was just really, really special. That's so awesome. I didn't, I didn't realize you were fourth place in the turn fly as Mel Stewart <laughs> would say, you got a wooden medal. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> <laughs> got the clap. That's a, that's a true hat trick. So you, you got first, second, third, fourth. Yes. Right. It's like, I planned it that way. All gold would have been really tacky. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's so Selfish. overdone. <laughs> it's been done before. <laughs> Who can say they did what I did? One of each with, with the wooden metal in there. One of I like each that <laughs> with the wood. I, I, yeah, I think, I think that's rarer air. <laughs> Dragging so, <laughs> moments. <laughs> so I, I love hearing about your Olympic moments, your your individual stories. That's super cool. So I've got to ask you, what are what are your thoughts heading into this week? First of all, do you have a schedule this week? Do, are you do you have other media? <laughs> Of course, this is the time in Pacific time that it's coming on our athletes. Um, yes, I have a schedule. I'm excited. I, I am going to sync up with swim outlet and do like a daily recap with them. Um, you know, obviously I'm super biased to the events I swam, right? I mean, it's like you follow what you know, They're but how do you, ones. yeah, yeah. You know, but how do you not get excited to watch Caleb Dressel and, you know, obviously really curious to see what, um, some manual is going to do, um, you know, and then on a personal level, being the GM of DC Trident, you know, I have a hand full of Olympians out there with Zach Apple and Zach Harding and Jay Leatherland. And, and then I have my international athletes that are Olympians too. So I feel like I'm going to have eyes all over. I'm just rooting for so many people. Um, and, and just as a huge, huge Katie Ledecky fan, and just, I just respect the heck out of her. I'm so excited to see what she's going to do and that we had the women's um, first ever 1500. I mean, that is really iconic. And I just, I just feel like Katie's going to crush that. And I'm, I'm so excited to see what she's going to do. And, and, and Erica with her there. I feel like she's going to put up, you know, a really great show too. And then kind of backtracking a little bit 
the, for the 800 freestyle, obviously eyes on Katie, but I'm super curious to see what other Katie's going to do. I mean, just her reaction at trials, how are you not a fan? And, and just to see somebody so young and pure and just, um, I, I can't help but think pretty naive going into this. Uh, it'll be exciting to see what she did. And and then on, and honestly, Coleman, my favorite race from trials was more like the reaction between Annie Laser and Lily King and the, and the 200 breaststroke. I can't wait to cheer for those ladies. Um, I have a real soft spot for Annie, um, great relationship with her. And then I've always been a huge Lily fan. And I feel like over the last few years, really gotten to know her even more. And I'm just rooting for them, really rooting for them. But um, in general, you know, it is such a blend of veterans and rookies. And I think that's going to be um, really beneficial on both sides. You know, that it's a lot of take from both the vet the veterans get that energy and that excitement and, and that I hope like sense of gratitude watching the rookies and then so much that the rookies get from the veterans and, and speaking of veterans, I'm just so excited and so proud of Allison Schmidt. I just hope she throws down so hard. I think it's so iconic what she's done and overcome and just her footprint on the sport and, her leadership. I'm so excited to see what Schmidt has uh, left for us. I, I wish we could be in, in team USA huddles. I really I do. <laughs> uh, I want to lead one USA. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I, I want to <laughs> lead the chant. And then and, and I want to hear what, what captain Simone, what captain Allison have to say uh i'm i like ryan ryan murphy and caleb dressel too i th I think they're great leaders but particularly like allison schmidt and simone yeah they, like, they have such footprints they've overcome such adversity publicly yeah. over this quad that it's just like mm -hmm. i want to hear what 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 they tell the group of very oh. young women you know absolutely um, it, it that would be sweet but i'm <laughs> i'm so i i talked to you mentioned the distance swimmers especially those sandpipers i talked yes. to their club coach ron and after after talking to him and how methodical he is with their distance tra with, with training that can often be so mundane and 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 boring it's like whoa he he really knows what he's doing i think i'm really excited to see them swim too but let's yeah. talk 400 IM. It's, okay. it's the first event tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's, it was your baby back then. What are you thinking now? You know, the biggest thing or like the advice I would give is to control your excitement because it's hard being the first up. It's hard to be the first day. You don't know what to expect. Really. You haven't seen, you haven't seen it done yet. Right. And so I wouldn't want to be last and I wouldn't want to be first. I would want like two, three days to kind of like see what my teammates are doing, get the low down. So for the 400 I am, I feel like you have to really, or, or anybody swimming tomorrow, you really have to control your excitement, your nerves, your anxiety, um, and just be prepared because you don't know yet. Right. And so I think for the 400 I am, specifically you got to be careful that first hundred fly <laughs> you really have to be careful that first hundred fly like whoo, just you know don't get too excited my biggest advice would be like stick to your game plan um you know you have two veterans with chase and jay and i i feel like they've been there done that just knowing their demeanor and their temperament i mean jay could not be more laid back i think chase is laid back but he's very um He's very passionate and he's very um, competent. So I think that's going to really work in his favor. I think they're going to have tough competition. Absolutely. But if Jay can have that same 20 yard, or 20 meters that he had at trials, I mean, that was exciting to see. And having said that the same for Emma on the lady side, I am very curious to see what Emma does. You know, I thought um, at trials, she wasn't extremely on my radar, not to say she wasn't, but I was a little surprised. And I was definitely blown away by her, you know, how she brought it home. That was very, very impressive. I think with Haley, you have, again, you have a veteran, you have something that's been there before. She's not her first rodeo. And, you know, she's a little bit older in the sport anyways, you know, and her background with Bob Bowman, I just, I feel like Haley, I, I feel like we'll have a really solid swim for her. Um, the biggest thing is you got to be top eight after prelims. That's all that matters. Get your hand on the wall for top eight, get settled in and let, you know, finals take over, you know, as far as you've been there before you've done it at trials, which I think a lot of times has more anxiety than the Olympics stick to your game plan because I've, 
you know, obviously every race has such a game plan, but the 4am specifically. It make it's, I mean, hearing you talk about it, thinking it through, it's like, man, it's a lot of the 400 IM. There's a lot of room to, to let that energy get to you or to let yeah. those nerves get to you, Absolutely. especially when it's prelims finals in the same day. Yep. Do, do you think prelims or finals, there is more of an opportunity to let that energy get overwhelming? Do you think it's easier to perform in one or the other? That's a great question. For me, I was always a finals person. Like I just loved to race. It was almost like, okay, let's get this prelims thing over with. Um, but then again, that's the whole thing. Like yeah. my teammate at both of my Olympics didn't qualify for finals after prelims. It's like, ugh, like that's your, that should be your number one priority and goal. And, and for me, I'm proud to say like, that's one of my things that I'm proud of is that I finaled in every single one of my Olympic races. And I feel like as an Olympian, that should be your number one. Cause it's one step, one foot from the other, right? You can't get ahead of yourself being like, oh, I want to win the gold. It's like, ah, you got to get top eight first. Uh, cause sometimes that's, that step gets forgotten. You can't win gold if you're not top eight. That's a good point. And, and <laughs> I, I think in, I think in the USA, we like kind of take it for granted, right? Yes. It's like, oh yeah, they're going to get top eight. And then, and then yes. someone does and you're like, I, I think that's really well put as an American, you take it for granted. And honestly, the first thing that made me think of Coleman was the men's uh, point of freestyle at trials. It was just a given top two of the Olympics. And I literally had no idea about the whole thing. I was like, wait, what? You have to have a time cut? I, and, I, and I was asking people, like, did you know this? Did you know this? They're like, it's never been an issue for Team USA. So we're, you know, here we, we're Team USA. We don't we don't have these issues. Oh, yeah, it happens. <laughs> I that's That's such a great example because... <laughs> As I, the, the other thing that was such an emphasis at trials was the, uh, you know, like second place isn't guaranteed a spot or like fifth or sixth on the relay isn't guaranteed. And yeah. everyone was like, wait, what? Oh, what? Really? You can't explain like, it to people. <laughs> well, not technically. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's so funny. Cause at trials they're like, okay, either you or Brendan have to explain this to the crowd. I was like, uh, right, Brendan, I defer to Brendan. I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> yeah. Those ghosts. Those ghosts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was, it, and, and it was cool that USA swimming was kind of putting more of an emphasis on that, especially, yeah. as, especially after, you know, kind of the, the Phelps Lochte Coughlin era where it's like you, we had these athletes on both sides, men and women who would swim six, seven, eight events. Right. And so there was so many double ups. It was just like, well, yeah, all the spots are in. Right. That was another thing too. We were like reminiscing about like, oh, back in our day, we had tons of people that doubled up. And then at this past trials, we're like, okay, who can double up? And we're like counting, you know, I was like, it's a lot of math that I've never really had to do before. <laughs> and, I, and I think even on the last, the, the, the very last day of trials, it came down to like Abby doubled up in, in the 50 and hundred. And therefore I think Brooke 40 got, got, up. got her spot. Great. Uh, how many are on this team? Are we at 53? Cause I thought we could only take 52, but I feel like I keep hearing 53. Do you oh, know? I thought, it, I thought it was less. I thought it was 50. Oh. I think there's oh, okay. 26 women and 24 men. And, and then they brought two extra coaches with those two extra roster spots. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I, I think is what happened. Yeah. Little, little knowledge for you listeners. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, Cause I was just, afraid. Brushing up. <laughs> yeah. So I think that I'm pretty sure that's the case. Um, so, and I, and I'm going to ask you to put your DC Trident hat on just okay. a little bit. Uh, I will divulge a, a very uh, secretive piece of information on my swim, swam, pick them. I picked Zach Apple to win the hundred freestyle. <laughs> don't do that to me. Don't. I, and I don't like <laughs> jinxing people. Wow. I love it. I mean, I have been such a huge Zach Apple fan. Zapple, I like to call him, um, from season one. We've had him since season one. And honestly, I've really seen him not only develop in the pool, but out of the pool. And I think a lot of times when you start having confidence and maturity and develop out of the pool, you become naturally become a better swimmer. Um, I noticed a big difference from season one, to, from season two, just his leadership and his confidence, you know, speaking out loud and, and, and leading the team, not only by his speed, but by his leadership. And I feel like when those two components meet, 
the maturity in and out of the pool when you blossom, that's when amazing things happen. So I, I'm a huge Zapple fan. I am wishing him so much speed and good luck. And my biggest thing is just health. I want everybody to stay healthy and I want everybody to enjoy. I, I can't imagine the amount of pressure that athletes are probably putting on themselves or that they've been through this last go. And so I just hope there's a sense of just happiness and gratitude and, and enjoyment and, and, and health. That's like my number one thing right now. That's a great point. It's a great closing point is that the last 18 months have, have, have been a global pandemic, mm -hmm. a lot of stress, a lot of cancellations. We put this off for a year and yeah, yeah hopefully the athletes, the fans, everyone can just enjoy that. It's finally happening. It's finally here. We get to race and we get to enjoy the, right. th this competition. Right. Let's just support them and be positive. I just feel like social media is just such a way that people get behind and they write unnice things and, or, or blow things out of proportion. It's like, let's just be kind and supportive and respectful and not just now, but always, but especially to these athletes that have just put so much on the line. And, and I, again, I think that's a great closing point, Caitlin. It's always <laughs> great chatting with you and you. and getting your olympic perspective uh, ahead of these 2020 tokyo olympic games thank you so much is do you have a highlight one moment you're looking forward to this week oh the mixed medley relay come on i'm so excited for that oh i can't who's gonna be on it what's gonna be the strategy like i don't know i can't wait <laughs>